morning, everyone, and uh, thanks to, for, to Stimia for inviting me to talk about my experience with the ERC funding and, and talk about my project. So uh, basically, what I will, considering the time that we have, so what I will propose you to, uh, is to give you a very basic overview about the ERC project that I'm uh, that I'm directing right now. The, the whose name is Palio You you can you can find more information here in the web page and and about the about everything of the project, okay, the research team, the the different working packages. And also for the second part of my presentation, I will provide you some tips for people who might be interested in applying to the ERC uh, grants. Okay. Um, well, basically, uh, what we are analyzing here in this project is uh, or what this the main aim of the Paladin project is to reconstruct the population patterns and the cultural transmission processes during the late Glacial and early Holocene in southwestern Europe. This, uh, this uh, period is of really high scientific interest because the human populations had to face uh, extreme changes in climate and, and environmental con and climate and environmental conditions. And um, yes, uh, can you hear me? So I, I won't move from, from here. Okay. And uh, basically, as you can see in, the, in, this, in this slide, this is the reconstruction of the temperatures for the time period that we are an analyzing. And what you can see are really, this is a really environmentally dynamic period of time, okay, with major uh, changes in temperature, in uh, vegetation cover, uh, that was also mediated by uh, crisis, by short climatic crisis. But at the same time, uh, this period of the human prehistory Witness some of the major transformations in cultural in cultural patterns and technology that we have ever documented in the in the in the human prehistory, uh, and these changes that we have documented uh, don't follow a simple pattern. Don't go from simple to more complex. We can find here the loss of sophisticated technologies at the end of the Upper Paleolithic, also the spread of uh, technological innovations and also changes in graphic tra in, in the graphic traditions. These changes are affecting the way in which people communicate uh, each other, the people, the way in which people transmit their technological knowledge. So, considering this context, so the two main research questions that we have is to what extent hunter-gatherers' population levels were affected by climate and environmental change, and secondly, how the spatial structure of human populations affected the cultural transmission processes, the way in which information is transmitted through generations. So what we have proposed in this project is to use a novel and multi-scale and multidisciplinary scientific approach, combining three different analytical scales. First, at micro or at local scale, what we're interested in is to know uh, how the population fluctuations are related with short climate, uh, with short term fluctuations in climate using the, the human scale, basically by comparing high resolution paleoecological records with, uh, with act, uh, archaeological information from archaeological, from residential campsites. Second, at regional scale, uh, what we are interested in is in to reconstruct relative population densities and to see the potential relationship with long-term environmental dynamics. And for doing that, we are relying on the statistical analysis of the radiocarbon record as a, a population proxy. And finally, at micro-regional level, so we pretend to use network analysis and network modeling for analysis uh, to analyze the the relationship between patterns of connectivity regarding cultural transmission processes. So um, I don't have too much more time for for explaining all the project, okay? And I will skip very soon in for the experience regarding the preparation. But I would, I just want to bring your attention to this paper that came published today. Two days ago, okay. This is the the work that has been done 
on the second working package, on the reconstruction of population densities at a regional scale. Uh, and also because we are in one conference of computer applications <laughs> and, and quantitative methods. Uh, people who might be interested in, 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 this, in this part of the project, in these methodologies, I, I will strongly recommend to, to read also the supplementary information of the paper, where you can find uh, all the methods that they have followed, um, uh, including the data, the, the data collection and the discussion of the different uh, analytical procedures that we have followed in this case study. So uh, basically in this paper what we are trying to do is to reconstruct the population levels in the Iberian Peninsula using radiocarbon, radiocarbon dates. Uh, the reason why we're doing this is because we now have much better methods, statistical methods, to use this proxy in a much more consistent way than we had in the past, 10 years ago. And also because uh, new ancient DNA evidence provides a new context to investigate the relationship between population dynamics at continental scale. But uh, independent proxies are necessary in order to confirm and to contrast uh, these hypotheses. And only the right carbon record right now provides the only proxy where we can follow, where we can track changes through time at regional scale with the necessary resolution. Um, and the last reason is because uh, we don't have an holistic view of the demographic changes in this part of Europe uh, uh, using the radio carbon record. And, and, and in fact, most of the previous uh, works that have assessed the reconstruction of population dynamics using radio carbon data have focused uh, majoritarily in the Mesolithic Neolithic transition. And we don't know very well yet the endogenous processes of demographic growth in hunter gatherers uh, societies. So, uh, this is the methods that we have been using and that we have been applying throughout this working package. So, starting for the data collection and the statistical analysis of radiocarbon time series which entails so this, the database that covers it's a georeference database that we have compiled so without the, 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 the implementation of, of the action. Uh, right now, this case study uh, comprises a total of 1,198 radiocarbon dates for this time period that comes from the late glacial and the early Holocene. And basically, these are the methods that we have applied so the, from the frequency analysis, considering different types of sites, the summit probability distributions, and the bootstrap simulations on the summit probability distributions in order to minimize the effects of the calibration process in the observed patterns, and then uh, trying to compare uh, our results with a simulated. Uh, uh, ensembles of dates that are simulating exponential um, models of exponential growth. Um, basically, in, in the paper, you will find the, the link to the Zenodo and the GitHub repositories where you can get the data and you can get the scripts if you want to reproduce uh, this with your, with your uh, just by yourself or you, if you want to try with another kind of data set and this is basically the workflow that we have implemented in the um, in the analysis of the um, of the radio carbon record in order to get the SPD population proxy and I won't go for time in too much details but just ask me in the coffee break if you have doubts and this is what the results looks like basically so this is the bootstrap uh, uh, simulations on the original SPD. So the, the, the black ball line which represents is the median of the confidence interval of the bootstrap simulations, which is considered the population proxy here. What you can see is the, is the comparison of our population proxy with a simulated uh, uh, sample of radiocarbon dates. Uh, following a kind of exponential demographic growth. The pink uh, bands, what they represent, are the periods 
in which the population, the estimated population levels are um, uh, above the exponential null model, whereas the blue lines would they represent are the periods of these time series in which uh, the populations are really uh, below of the exponential uh, null model. Uh, we did this for the Iberian Peninsula and we assess also this uh, for each regional <laughs> subset in order to account for the uh, subregional pattern variation in the, in, the, in the observed trends. Uh, one of the main contributions in this for this paper and for this work is to uh, test different demographic uh, models. Okay, so <coughs> one thing is just to reconstruct from the empirical data what you have, and another thing, and uh, one step forward is to try to is try to, to test different models of, of demographic growth. Uh, what we have, what you can see, sorry, okay, what you can see here in this image are in the black line are the, the SPD population proxy. And we have fitted here several different models, uh, just for one phase following an exponential uh, demographic growth, another following a logistic growth, and the model C that are two exponential regimes that are uh, separated by a population collapse during the jagged dryas. And uh, here below, you can find also one first exponential regime followed by one logistic regime of demographic growth. And these two less models that are following an exponential growth and a stable growth for the second phase and a third exponential growth. And this model what represents an exponential growth and exponential decay towards um, a stabilization and a third demographic regime of logistic growth. Uh, what we have used is an uh, information theory based model selection approach based on bias and information criteria and I take as information criteria in order to test which one of these models fits better with the data that we have. Okay. Do you follow me? So I'm uh, am, am I clear on this? Uh, of course, uh, each one of these models have been discussed and the implication, the biodemographic implications of each one of these models have been discussed previously. So the, the model selection gives us the highest uh, goodness of fit for this model, okay? Which basically is, are, is telling us that during the, the end of the Magdalenian period, during the end of the late uh, glacial, the populations were um, following what describing an exponential growth with growth rates approximately about the 0 0.04 uh, uh, percent. Then during the younger trials we find an exponential decay towards a limited value and we find during the Mesolithic period a new demographic regime that is following a uh, logistic demographic growth. Um, I'm going to Go for, I'm going to start with the second part of the of the of my talk regarding the the my experience with the ERC funding. So for all you guys that might be interested in applying for the ERC, I strongly recommend it to, to you to do it. Uh, in my from my personal experience, uh, it was a really nice opportunity. And so you don't have you have nothing to lose for applying to the, to the ERC. But it's really important also that you consider very well and that you think very well about your career stage, okay? Um, when do you want to apply for an ERC? It is the right moment or not, okay? Uh, depending in, the, in your research track and depending in the, in the state in which you are performing your research, okay? And uh, well, so what I see basically is that this was a really nice funding opportunity for my career goals at the moment when I applied for that. So how I did it? So, um, so at Timi I have done a really nice introduction about how the ERC schemes uh, work. Uh, but if you are considering to apply for uh, an ERC grant, if you are considering to prepare your own proposal, I strongly recommend you that you analyze, and, and I'm saying analyze, 
previously uh, e uh, funded projects or previous ERC funded projects. So, what kind of, of projects were being funded by European Commission? Think about um, this and especially avoid to, to create a project that is mostly based on incremental research. Okay? You have to try to bring something new. And it is really important here that you find a gap in your field, that you have find one or two relevant research questions that you want to assess or that you want to address with your proposal. Uh, as Timia also mentioned before, uh, it is really important that you find big research questions, transversal research questions. In the case of our proposal, the questions were demography and culture as an evolutionary system. Okay, and also I'm, I strongly recommend uh, going for hypothesis-driven research questions because it's, 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 it's the way in which you can really link better the methods that you want to implement during the action with the big theoretical questions, with the state of the art. And of course, trying to be uh, methodologically innovative. Um, some suggestions also for future applicants. So if you think that this is your time, do it. Okay, but as I mentioned to you before, think uh, thinking about it is your time is, is difficult considering the time that you can apply and the time window. So for instance, if you think that you are starting one path that shows that uh, you are the person who can really lead the research that you are proposing, probably you have to consider to have to create a small data set before, uh, a kind of small proof of concept about the scientific approach that you want to, to follow. Okay? And this also is something that you have to balance, that you have to evaluate by yourself. Okay? Because at the end, the, 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 the panel is going to look for that and it's going to appreciate if you have, for instance, published one paper that it's a part of this seminar work that you want to further develop using the ERC grant. Uh, takes time, as uh, Anne has mentioned. Um, and don't wait for the last moment. Probably it's something that you need to, you need time for doing, for preparing a proposal, and to, for conceptualizing really well the proposal. Talk with your research center that save you time for doing this, or trying to save time for, for, for preparing for the proposal writing. A support team is necessary, okay, but uh, in my personal experience, not too big, okay. What you must show is the scientific independence, is not uh, making other people to write different parts of your proposal. You have to have a strict control about what you want to do in, in your research, because at the end you will have to present or to defend this publicly in the interview if you are selected for the step two. Uh, think as a referee, so try to identify the, the flows and the, the, the potential flows of your proposal, okay? And also, as Tina said, think in terms of balance and balance the risk and the feasibility and the communication, thinking about one a panel that is going to be generalist at the end of the day. Uh, the impact of the ERC is really important. Uh, the, that's the reason why I strongly recommend you, because uh, you are not going to find many other places where you can get funding for this kind of bottom-up research. Okay, and in Spain, uh, this research would have been impossible with the current funding financial schemes, and also because it allows you. Uh, to have a considerable budget in order to hire people. If you are doing sometimes very innovative research that is not very well established in your country, uh, the ERC funding is a really, really nice option to hire people to start your own research team. Uh, this is just one of my latest, uh, latest slides. This is the in the context of the EIA, so we did a session at the end of the second year of the project with all the team members of the scientific collaborators present 
papers in the project. And this is really nice also about the ERC. It allows you to set up the scientific agenda regarding your topic, okay? And uh, well, basically I, what I would like to sum up is that the ERC grants have a transformative value in the career development of the PA and also of the team members. That this research in my case so would have not been possible without the ERC funding. And uh, the building the research networks and to enhance the scientific impact uh, is, is really one of the benefits of this fund and also for applying for future funding schemes. Uh, that's all, so thank you very much.